Um, I would like to talk today about novel uh, photoelectrochemical device, devices based on earth abundant advanced materials to produce solar hydrogen. So I'm afraid um, we are talking about a uh, technology with a much lower TRL than photovoltaics, of course. But we need to fight, I think. We need to fight. This will be my conclusion, but let's see. Oh, uh, all this work um, was done in the, in the, uh, during the implementation of the Photo H2 project. This was a uh, European project, Horizon 2020. It was coordinated by the University of Alicante, and there were just uh, five partners with a very high level of commitment. Uh, <laughs> the University of Alicante, CNR in Italy, and three small uh, and medium-sized enterprises. Next slide. I like very much this, this uh, uh, figure because it summarizes very well the different technologies at hand for solar hydrogen production. And there's one which is much more mature than the rest, this one. The combination <laughs> of a uh, conventional PV with a conventional electrolyzer. Is there room for anything else? This is the question I would like to, to discuss today. Yeah, I think there is. Uh, please. But, but well, yeah. Could, could you go to, to the previous, previous, previous one? Previous. Yeah. That one. Here you see, I will, I will talk a lot about this one today, about the photoelectrochemical water splitting. Uh, there, are, there are several commonalities with the, with the mature system, because we, we, we have two electrodes, but these electrodes have the characteristics of being semiconductors that are, are able to absorb light and directly transform it into chemicals, into hydrogen in this case. So there are common things with the mature technology, but also particularities that make uh, this technology challenging in a way. Oh, next slide. Uh, in, in this photoelectrochemical cell, we could think of one photoactive electrode or two photoactive electrodes. Both approaches could be useful and fruitful. In our case, and because of theoretical reasons, we uh, preferred the uh, two photoelectrode approach, which is basically the basis of a tandem photoelectrochemical cell. Next slide. This is just a picture of the first idea that came to our mind when we were starting the project. We had a, uh, well, the idea is to have a photoanode, a photocathode. On the photoanode, we will have the uh, production of hydrogen on the photo uh, of oxygen, sorry, on the photocathode, we will be producing hydrogen with the photogenerated electrons. And then in between them, we would have a membrane, which needs to be, of course, an ion conductor. So it's the polymer electrode membrane that is uh, common in, uh, in uh, electrolyzers. Next slide. This is another uh, configuration, which is also uh, feasible uh, for developing this technology. In this case, we have both photoactive materials short-circuited. There's an ohmic contact in between them. The disadvantage of this approach is that you can't apply a bias in addition to sunlight to the system. In the previous uh, configuration, you could apply both solar light and an electrical bias to the device in order to produce hydrogen. Next slide. So I, I would like to <laughs> give my honest answer to this question. Is it viable PC water splitting versus PB plus electrolysis? Okay, next slide. I, I, I was thinking about uh, this question uh, while preparing the presentation and I decided to, to just make an exercise, SWOT analysis about the water splitting with photoelectrochemical devices. Are there strengths? Of course there are strengths. In my opinion, in the case of a photoelectrochemical uh, device, we are talking about a monolithic, simple device, not requiring coupling with other inputs. That's relevant because this could help 
to have potentially cheaper developments than in other technologies. It's also important that in the case of a photoelectrochemical cell, water flow could allow for thermal management of the module. And this has been discussed previously about the efficiency of PV, depending on temperature. Here we can play with water. So in a flow system, water is not only the reagent, but also helps the thermal management of the device. This is a strength. Weaknesses, many weaknesses. Yeah, the durability of materials and devices is poor nowadays. Solar to hydrogen efficiency is low for cost-effective materials. System capital cost and balance of system costs are high because you need a lot of area because of the lower efficiencies. And of course, there is a lack of a clear business case and a lack of codes and standards. But this is derived from being a, TRL, uh, a low TRL technology. Opportunities. I think there are opportunities, of course. It, it would be a really a, a important breakthrough to develop the first commercial uh, module. And uh, I think that it would be very good for the, for the EU industry to, to try to, to contribute to this breakthrough. There are European national research and innovation funds available for this research. And also, uh, we could all think of the co-production of value-added chemicals by substituting water oxidation by the oxidation of organics in such a way that the organics produced uh, have uh, a, um, a higher added value. Threats. Well, there are uncertainties on the viability of a hydrogen cost lower than two euros per kilogram. Uncertainties because um, there have been already 50 years of research and development on this without commercialization, that's important. Uh, and of course, industry feels too risky to invest in this technology. And I, I, I don't want to hide this. <laughs> There's a very strong competition from the more mature PB plus uh, technology. Next slide. This is my personal view of, you know, a, a reasonable and uh, realistic and positive at the same time horizon. The current technology readiness level low, three to five, depending on the, on the way we analyze this. Uh, we are here now. Take into account these values for solar irradiation. So this is the hydrogen production we are having now. The, sim the system cost is around 300 euros per square meter. The system lifetime is very low, one third of a year. So if we can develop a technology which triples system lifetime and hydrogen production while reducing by a factor of three system cost, we would be in a good track, I think, for developing a technology. Uh, this would be accompanied, uh, previous, previous slide, this would be accompanied by the pilot plant, of course, with these uh, numbers. We could uh, think of a pilot plant with one square, one, one, one thousand square meters. And this could lead in the, in the, the, by, by, the, by the middle of the century to large uh, scale PC farms, maybe one terawatt. I'm being optimistic here, but it could be the case. If we develop a technology uh, within the next 10 years, which meets at least these uh, indicators. Next slide. Okay, benchmark result in the literature. I'm restricting myself to oxide materials. There are many fancy materials you can use as photoelectrodes, but is it reasonable or viable to use them for this application? That's a good question. If we restrict ourselves to oxide materials, 3% solar to hydrogen efficiency. That's all, 12 hours of stability. Benchmark technologies, PV plus electrolyzer, STH efficiency of up to 15%. Uh, steam methane reforming, cost lower than two kilograms, two, two euros uh, per, per kilogram. So, next slide. With all this, you know, uh, 
things in, <laughs> in mind, we, we decided to address the development in photo H2 of a tandem photoelectrolysis cell based on durable and cost-effective advanced materials and interfaces. With a simple flow cell design, with an input of pure water, that's very important, and in, with the production of pure hydrogen in the output stream. Next slide. This is uh, just what I showed before. This is the basics of the design we had in mind at the beginning of the project. Next slide. This is the same thing, but with a bit, little bit more of detail. We have here the uh, FTO, the transparent uh, uh, conducting glass. On top of it, we have the photo anode. Uh, in our case, it was hematite. Then the transparent ion exchange polymer membrane. The photocathodic material would be deposited here on top of a porous hydrophobic backing in such a way that the hydrogen produced in the photocathode could be removed through the back of the electrode. And being hydrophobic, the uh, degree of dryness of the hydrogen was quite high. Of course, uh, electrodes should have complementary light absorption. Electrolytes should have minimal light absorption and resistance. Uh, the, the membrane, the separators, should avoid crossover of the electrolysis products. And the, the design should have good scalability and we thought of a flat configuration. Next slide. This is just a picture of what we wanted to have at the end of the, of the project as a demonstrator. This is the unit cell, as I just explained to you a moment ago. Uh, the, the cells would constitute or would, would be uh, replicated to form a module, and uh, several models would end up forming the photoelectrochemical panel with the ancillary equipment for hydrogen uh, purification, and uh, storage, power supply for the, in the case that bias is needed, and uh, uh, water feeding. Next slide. Photoelectrode requirements. We have many of them. Uh, so photoelectrochemistry is hindered in a way because of the many restrictions we, was, we want to or we need to uh, deal with simultaneously. Narrow band gap. Adequate bandage locations for water uh, reduction and oxidation reactions, high chemical stability in the dark and in the illumination, good charge transport, low over potentials for the half reactions. And in addition, if we want to be practical, low cost reagents, low cost and scalable synthesis route, materials composed of earth abundant elements, non toxic and environmentally friendly materials. Everything together. Next slide. We thought of uh, um, ternary oxides. Uh, we also worked with uh, binary oxides, but we thought of finding new materials. Uh, but it is, this is very, uh, very interesting from a scientific point of view because we employed both theoretical and experimental methods for, for identifying new uh, oxides that could perform well in water photo, photoelectrolysis. Next slide. Of course, we follow the, as, as always, a bibliographical uh, search, but also a theoretical screening methodology using a uh, density functional theory based calculations to determine band gaps and also transfer properties of the oxides. In such a, a way, we can just restrict ourselves in terms of candidate materials in order to uh, perform the experimental benchmarking. Next slide. This is a typical synthesis we employed most of the time. A simple uh, technique based on the salt gel method and spin coating. This is not good for, uh, for uh, scaling up, but it's good for experimental, you know, benchmarking for in, and, uh, um, you know, screening many different materials. Next slide. This is the typical measurements that we did with each of the materials. Uh, physical characterization, uh, optical characterization, and of course, photoelectrochemical characterization in order to see the potential of uh, any material in this technology. Next slide. This is just an example of uh, uh, hematite syn synthesis. This is a typical hematite synthesis. synthesis. We have uh, nano, nano columns here on, on the FTO substrate. Take into account that the, the electrode is nanostructured bec because this is important in order to design a proper uh, photoelectrochemical cell. Next slide. This is just an example of how to scale up 
uh, for for uh, preparing enough electrodes and have a prototype of, or are, are demonstrated at the end of the project the, the synthesis. This is a chemical bath deposition, and it is very easy to uh, scale up. Uh, and uh, well, that's why we we just refined it as much as possible in order to have the maximum efficiency. This is just a. Uh, the different metrics for efficiency that we employ in photoelectrochemical devices. This is a typical one. You find this one always in the literature, but it's, also, it's always useful in our view to uh, uh, talk or to uh, use more frequently the throughput efficiency, in which we employ both uh, you know, solar light and external bias as inputs for the uh, cell. Next slide. I said that uh, the project was uh, dealing with uh, both theory and experimentation uh, to determine practical uh, materials or to identify practical materials. We also performed uh, modeling at the device level in order to see if the materials that uh, we were developing at that time, and I'm, I'm, I'm describing here the case of uh, the photocathode based on cupric oxide and a photoanode based on uh, hematite, we just collected uh, characteristics from the literature and we were able to develop a model uh, who told us, uh, or the model, that the, the efficiency in principle through this map, the efficiency under zero bias was high enough for our purposes, 11% theoretically, theoretically. Next slide. This is just the different variables we played with uh, in this you know, uh, macroscopic model for, for device modeling, uh, doping density for the photoanode, absorption coefficient of the photoanode, binarity carrier diffusion length, difference in flat band potentials. Next slide. This is just a, a picture in which uh, um, I want to just emphasize the difference between the typical configuration in which the photocathode is just deposited on a uh, non porous substrate and our configuration in which the photocathode was deposited on a porous hydrophobic substrate. And this enabled us to get the hydrogen through the back of the electrode. This is a major novelty, I would say, of the PhotoH2 project. This is just an example of the, of the photoelectrochemical measurement and the different uh, efficiencies that we got at the, at the lab level. And it also shows very nicely the influence of the ionomer dispersion loading. I don't have time to go into details, but forming the interface between the polymer electrode membrane and the active material is very important. So it's not only materials, but, not, but also defining very precisely the interfaces. Also in these chemical systems is very important. Next slide. This is the idea we came up at the end of the project in order to develop uh, or to, to fabricate the demonstrator. We had several problems during the assembly of the different components, and we thought of a concept we, that, that we christened as glass electrode membrane assembly. So the idea was to just uh, put together the active components, the main components of the device, and then to integrate them into a frame with the rest of the components of the cell. It's similar to the, you know, uh, membrane electrode assembly that you have uh, po probably heard of in, 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 you know, electrolysis, in conventional electrolysis. So the main idea here is just to put together everything at the very beginning, the anion exchange membrane, the uh, hydrophobic layer plus photocathode, and also the photoanode. But you see, the photoanode is just supported on a drilled conducting glass. Because we discovered that it's very important for this technology that the membrane is always wet. There's a tendency, of course, uh, to dry from point to point. Uh, there are points in the membrane that are not adequately hydrated, and that's a major problem for the functioning of the device. So by drilling the glass, we solved this. And these uh, holes, we're able to provide water to the membrane and also to extract oxygen produced at the photoanode. Next slide. 
this is the way the unit cell looks like. <laughs> you can see here the color of hematite, which is the, this you know red, dark red color, and you also see here the holes that allowed the water to get into the system. Next slide. These are the components of the cell. Uh, next slide. Unit cell. This is very interesting because here we demonstrated that it doesn't matter if you fit the system, the device, either with water, pure water, or with a KOH solution. The efficiency is exactly the same, and that's very important because the system can just run with pure water. Yeah, this is just a demonstration that uh, through, through mass spectrometry that we were producing hydrogen through mass spectrometry. Next slide. This is the process of mounting uh, one, one module in the panel. Here, this can distinguish here, this is just a unit cell, the GMA concept. And then, yeah, those were integrated into the panel Next slide. And finally, you know, there's a cover here, a transparent cover, in order to allow water to flow, you know, in between this lid and the drilled FTO and to flow through the, through the system. This is the half panel rear part. This is uh, the half panel filled with water. This is uh, the final assembly. In the final configuration, the photoelectrochemical uh, uh, panel was formed by two modules. The active area was close to one square meter. And this is just uh, the, the map of what we did, basically. This is the concept, first cells, first uh, design for the photoelectrochemical cell. It didn't work. We restarted and we thought of the GEMA concept that finally led to the unit set that I showed you. And finally, of course, by integrating them into uh, a module, into a panel to the demonstrator. Next slide. This is the demonstrator. <laughs> Very nice demonstrator. It was installed in, in Italy, in Sicily, actually, because two of our partners are fr were, were from, from Sicily. You have the panel here. This is the cabinet with the ancillary equipment for hydrogen uh, compression and uh, uh, storage and purification. And this is the water tank for feeding the system. Next slide. These are the, the preliminary results that we obtained with the, with the panel uh, during the day, at night. Next slide. This is just a, a uh, current time curve showing that the uh, panel was reasonably stable. Next slide. That one. And then if I would like, if I, if I would have to summarize the main achievements and challenges that we, we finally, uh, I would say, discovered during the project, we would say that these are the achievements, efficient oxide porous carbon substrate, efficient oxide PEM configuration, good scalability, flat cell configuration fed with water, noble cell and module design. Problems, scalability of the cell in terms of efficiencies. It suffers a lot of efficiency during the scaling up, and this is typical of electrochemical systems. And also in this case, we found this, this problem durability of the photocathode. That's a major problem in photoelectrochemistry. We still need to find a way to, of solving this because the photocathode in this case, cupric oxide was not stable enough. In spite of the fact that PEM protects to some extent the materials in comparison with liquid electrolytes. Next slide. CAPEX in principle could be low enough if we reach 5% STH and a durability in between th three and 10 years, depending on, on, on the mass production volumes. OPEX could be extremely cheap for this technology, 
global warming potential was quite good. Uh, in this respect, it was superior or lower, actually, than the, that corresponding to the uh, photovolt typical photovoltaic panels. Next slide. And then I would like to end up answering the question. <laughs> Is it viable PC water splitting versus PV plus electrolysis? Yes, but. And then I, ad I adhere 100% to this abstract appeared in Frontiers in Energy. Yeah, here. It is suggested that the PC should target on high solar to hydrogen efficiency. This is obvious. But based on cheap semiconductors in order to maintain its role in the technological race of sustainable hydrogen production. In science, it's very interesting to work with fancy materials. I also like fancy materials. But if we want to be practical in photoelectrochemical devices, we need to find a way of increasing efficiencies and durability of uh, materials based on earth abundant elements. There is no other way, I think. Yeah, uh, I would like, of course, to, to acknowledge very much all the work done uh, within the uh, Photo H2 consortium and to you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberto, for sharing your passion. Your, I think it was contagious, actually. Also, yeah. your, your, your transparency about the difficulties, the SWOT analysis. Um, we are a bit late, but I'm sure we, you would agree that we, we collect two or three questions and you answer them in one go, OK? Yeah, right. OK. And can I ask already to the, our speakers to be ready to come fr in front one to close the session then. Thank you. Very, very nice presentation. I just wanted to ask you on the anodic side, you use iron oxide. What are your thoughts of integrating this part with steel industry, which produce a lot of waste iron oxides? And I'm not so sure why you need to purify and produce Fe2O3, because I think FeOOH, which, is we, which we know is ferry hydride, could be much better ca uh, catalytically than Fe2O3, because Fe2O3, everything is in three plus state. Thank you. Another question? Okay, not the case. So, yeah, yeah, no, please. I can. Thank you. This was a really, really interesting and comprehensive overview. My general question for this approach is the following. The energy density of the direct sunshine is relatively low. In order to produce one megawatt of PV power, we need one hectare of area. And isn't it fundamentally much easier to collect the power with wires over such huge areas than thinking about collecting separately the water supply, the hydrogen tubing, you know, you might have clogging in, in such a huge area. So I always thought uh, all these attempts to make the so-called artificial photosynthesis, which goes in the same direction, are really, really not thinking about that it is a nightmare to have a, a, a huge area, square kilometer, harvesting sunlight and then having to collect hydrogen tubing, water tubing, and so on, instead of simply electricity. Okay, one last, one, one last, Roberto, which comes from the uh, colleagues connected via the web, um, also related to the previous question, but the importance of data. Yeah? Um, so uh, how can we uh, propel the use of data spaces with algorithms, um, so also the AI development? Uh, is that something you could and would consider relevant in um, in your project. So we have three questions. Okay, I'll start with the last one. Yes, uh, of course, it is relevant. Uh, we didn't follow this approach. The consortium was small, and uh, we decided to focus on uh, uh, tools that were more familiar for us. But of course, this is a very good direction for the future. Answering the question of Professor Weber. Okay. It depends very much. There are, there, are, there are answers to your question. For example, it depends on the, uh, um, you know, uh, for example, 
usefulness of solar light concentration in photoelectrochemical systems. This hasn't been addressed up to now in a serious way. Could I concentrate light on my device without losing too much efficiency or having an efficiency that it scales up or, or it's constant depending on, on uh, uh, power impinging on the cell? That could be an answer to your question because in that uh, way you would reduce very much the area needed for the photoelectrochemical system. This is one thing. Another thing is that you could be interested in producing hydrogen in a decentralized way, in an autonomous, self-standing way. If this is the case, maybe photoelectrochemical systems could something to say. But generally speaking, yes, uh, I, I mentioned from the very beginning, we have a very strong competition of a very mature technology. Sh should it mean that uh, we should abandon this? I, I don't think so. But it is true that we should have in mind, you know, uh, the strength of the mature technology. And the question on water, the purity of water? Okay, no, I, 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 very, briefly, very briefly. Yeah, I'll focus the question on, on hematite. Yeah, the interest of hematite. Yeah, we, we, at the beginning of the project, we were trying to find new materials, uh, new ternary oxides that could substitute hematite, actually. And we worked very hard for that, both from a theoretical point of view and from an experimental point of view. But at the end of the day, we discovered that hematite was superior if uh, modified in an appropriate way. And also, stability of hematite is excellent in contact with the polymer electrolyte membrane. It should be highlighted. That, that, that's why we, we, we just, you know, uh, decided to develop the prototype with hematite. But at the beginning of the project, we were thinking of different materials. But we were not successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, it's time to conclude. Jonas,